Welcome, everyone. We're at Ocean's Cybersecurity Day. It's been a lot of fun so far. I'm here with Matt McMahon. He's a graduate adjunct professor at Salve Regina University. Yep. Welcome, Matt. Now, Thanks for me. Matt, your specialty is healthcare. Is there a program for healthcare security or? Yeah, so there's a healthcare administration master's program. Um, within that, there's a, a specific concentration for cybersecurity. Uh, so you would take four classes. Uh, there's a mm -hmm. there's several other classes that you could take, um, but yeah, essentially taking twelve credits would get you a, a, a cybersecurity concentration in healthcare administration. Um, that's pretty awesome. Yeah. That's a good thing to have in your resume, whether you're yeah. going to do cybersecurity or not, right? I would think when they hire someone and having that would be a, a plus. I, I really like it because, you know, as we saw in the last talk, there's a shortage already in, you mm -hmm. know, in getting uh, folks into STEM programs. But I think it's really important in a, mass, in a management program to also get people mm -hmm. cyber aware and programs like that too. Absolutely. And make it really interesting, you know, have it you know, cybersecurity and healthcare, you know, d different topics. Like there's mm -hmm. one on um, uh, like uh, entrepreneurship and cybersecurity. And, yep. and so, there's, you know, get people interested in cybersecurity that wouldn't maybe normally in be in a traditional computer science program. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Yeah. And you said there's four classes that make up this concentration? Yeah. I th so two of them would be requirements, and then there's two electives that you mm -hmm. can pick. Um, Salve has, there's quite a few different class. There there's a few different programs that you can do a concentration of cybersecurity in. Mm -hmm. So the healthcare pr uh, program, healthcare master's program, the uh, administration of justice program. Mm -hmm. So there's... Uh, a broad swath of classes that you can take to, to right. pair with those. Um, I, I specifically teach the some of the the two requirements for healthcare would be cybersecurity and resiliency in healthcare, mm -hmm. and then cybersecurity and healthcare policy. Gotcha. So the resiliency in healthcare. I mean, healthcare is one of the most difficult industries to yeah. secure. I think it's right up there with universities, largely because yep. you have to allow so much communication and so much openness for a hospital to operate. Is essentially the crux of the issue, right? Absolutely. The, the resiliency class is, is more of a survey class. We cover, you know, topics that someone working in management, but mm -hmm. uh, well, who wants to be cyber aware in healthcare, we need to know. So we cover like cloud, um, yep. threat and risk assessment. A lot of wireless too. Yeah. I yeah. would imagine yep. that if you're coming into it, all of these devices have wire. Well, most of them have wireless, right? And that's a big concern in, in healthcare still today. Yeah, and just you know, connected medical devices um, mm -hmm. or unconnected medical devices, mm -hmm. updating, uh, you know, age of medical devices, things like that. So it gets right. gets really interesting. Yeah, it's interesting how long the healthcare equipment sticks around, right? I, like you could have an X-ray or an imaging machine that is deployed. For some time, I mean, you think about an MRI yeah, yeah. machine, right? I don't know if you've ever seen one being installed. My wife works in healthcare. Yeah, yeah. She's like, it, it takes like days to get, just to get it in the building. They have yeah. to like lift it with a, because it's a giant magnet, we, right? We, we call it a forklift update. Yes. <laughs> yes. That's what it is. <laughs> I, and I, those machines are expensive. Yeah. I think the average age is, uh, I think it's 5.7 years, okay. the average age of a medical device in, yep. the, in the U.S. Sure. So, yeah, it's, I mean, it, you know, the, some of the smaller point of care devices, they get them out and replace quicker. Yes. But like you said, a big CT device, an imaging device, Yeah. obviously that, you know, a, a hospital is expecting to buy that and have it in their hospital for you know, maybe 10, 15 years. And sure. obviously length of typical operating systems yeah, is less than interesting. that, yeah, right? Exactly. Yes, if you look, we've done that analysis before, right? Of how long an operating system can live before its end of life, yeah. right? And that's a very measurable thing. And we do this in the industrial control systems too, yeah. right? Well, how yeah. long does this device need to live in the field? Absolutely. So you have to pick something that, I mean, it's one reason why uh, open source or having a contract with a company that says, well, no, you will provide us with. Uh, you know, updates, at least for security reasons, yeah. right? And there is also, uh, in the U.S., we primarily look at just purchasing a device and then mm -hmm. keeping it till end of life or, you know, past end of life in some cases. Mm -hmm. But I know in Europe, there's a, at least in the medical device side, there's a little bit more adoption of like a leasing model. Yep. So, you know, that's another possibility to update medical devices. But in the U.S., we don't really see that catching on too much yet. Well, that's interesting. I wonder why. Yeah. That'd be a good model for... Yeah, I tried to research right? a little bit as yeah. to why. I think it's just... I mean, in the U.S., we, we lease our phones, we lease our cars. Sure. Why not a medical why device? Why not a medical device, right? Yeah. 
That's pretty cool. Uh, the other thing we're talking about on the policy side was uh, hospital policy has changed and evolved over time, largely because of regulation. Yeah, um, And it's interesting how that impacts people that work there and patients as well, yeah, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, I was giving the example – it, when you work, and this is standard in in all hospitals now, due to regulation, if you work there, if a patient is not your patient or some you're not involved in that patient's care, HIPAA says you're not allowed to look at those records. And it took the medical industry, <laughs> uh, healthcare industry, a long time yeah. to be able to have the technology to do that, right? To have that segregation, to, yeah, yeah, to be able to say if it's um, like a a medical software system, you know, you as nurse. A, only get to mm-hmm. see these five patients or 10 patients or how many patients you're caring for that day. Right. Um, not only has it taken a little while for the uh, technology to catch up to be mm-hmm. able to get there, but that includes fr- or that creates on the IT side a need for someone to actually manage that access, which that's that, Correct. That's a huge amount Correct. of uh, And the software to provide it. Is it uh, Epic is one of the largest yep. software the companies, ones. right? Yep. yep. Um, and so that I'm imagining it took them time to build maybe some new features in. And then when you do those upgrades, it felt to me like they were upgrading when I was at university, the mainframe that yep. ran essentially all of our ERP systems that was homegrown stuff or yep. you're upgrading SAP. Yeah. Epic was kind of similar yeah. in, in not knowing all the details about it, but it seemed pretty similar, right? Yeah, yep. And uh, that is no small task because it touches yeah. everyone who's involved with patient care at the hospital <laughs> and administration, is, like everyone at the hospital if you're an epic install, yeah. I mean, everyone's using it, right? And even when you have the technology, you still have to update it. So, you yep. know, most of the EMRs, Epic, Meditech, Cerner, mm-hmm. um, have had that capability to be able to segregate tasks and uh, only see PHI for certain patients for, yep. for a good amount of time now. But, you know, if a hospital changes, um, you know, restructuring, whatnot, mm-hmm. you have to go in and completely rebuild all that. So, right, right. again, it's really, I think, I think the biggest issue is, you're going to have to hire people full time mm-hmm. just to do uh, access management to to keep that Correct. up to date and constantly switch it. And I think it's I forget what the stat is, but it's something like 10 percent of nurses are and this, this varies by hospital, but mm-hmm. like 10 percent of uh, hospital nurses are, are tr- uh, not charge nurses, agency nurses mm-hmm. so that. You know, someone else calls in, they call an agency, they get a nurse. Correct. Managing yep. access for those floaters is, I bet. is a I huge bet. process. Yep. Well, that was awesome. I think we identified some yeah. areas, not necessarily the solutions, maybe, but yeah, well, maybe you got to do a program at Salve to, yeah, yeah. <laughs> to get those solutions. So. Absolutely. Awesome. Thank great. you so much, Matt. No problem. Hey, great talking to you. You too.